Welcome to a special edition of Trust Psyche Live. Travis Deruzza's dissertation defense, acting a part in the ecstatic love of the divine. I'm really touched to see all your faces here today to join me. It's been a, a long, long journey and your support really means a lot to me. So thank you. It's really cool to see all of you. I'm just looking at everyone who's here. <laughs> at this time, I'm gonna hand it over to Jake Sherman, my dissertation committee chair. He's gonna say a few words about what we're gonna do here today. Jake. Thanks, Travis. Uh, thank you uh, also to everyone who's joined for this. This is a really exciting event. Uh, not, only, not only exciting because of the sort of pomp and circumstance of what happens at a dissertation defense, but also particularly exciting because of the extraordinary work that Travis has produced. I think all of you who are here probably have some idea of how fantastic what Travis has been working on is and will be, uh, and you're bound to hear more about it very soon. I want to start by saying a few words about the event taking place today, uh, because it's, it's a chance for Travis to present work that he's been laboring on for an extremely long time, uh, and, and powerfully. Uh, I, I won't say too much about that at, at the moment, uh, but also what we're doing here is not just presenting Travis's work and letting you interact with it and letting those of us who are his examiners interact with it. We're also doing a ritual that effects a transition, really an initiation uh, from the status of being a student into the status of being something else, being what we call a doctor, a PhD. Uh, in the Middle Ages, when we first started awarding master's degrees and doctoral degrees, uh, these two different graduate degrees signaled two different things. The master of arts signaled that someone was ready to be a magister, which was a teacher. They'd mastered a certain amount of uh, material, a certain body of work, a certain procedures, and they could now teach it to others. And, but to be a doctor meant something above and beyond that. To be a doctor meant that you weren't just uh, informed and schooled and formed in a certain tradition, it also meant that you were now creating that tradition. To be a doctor meant that you'd not only mastered it, you'd not only, you're not only capable of teaching it, but you're capable of teaching at a new level, of teaching that which hasn't been taught before, of generating new knowledge, of generating new research, and of creatively expanding what our horizons are. Whitehead likes to talk about the work of the scholar as being that of imagining the future. And in many ways, that's what the doctoral degree was invented in order to recognize, to recognize that uh, there's a kind of work that one can put in that prepares them to engage responsibly in that act of imagining the future. Now what Travis has done and what our students in throughout PCC and throughout CIS and, and throughout the world are doing, I think is in continuity with what's been done over the last 800 years that doctoral degrees have been awarded. Uh, Travis is maybe even more so than a lot of what, uh, a lot of what we do at CIS is in deep, uh, rich continuity with what's been done for the last 800 years. Uh, because what Travis has done is engage powerfully, deeply, and in a sustained way with ancient roots of philosophy and theology, uh, the very, disciplines that the original doctoral degrees were invented to honor. But what we've been doing for the last 800 years in awarding doctoral degrees uh, is not only recognizing this work, but also testing the candidate for the doctorate to see whether they can undergo the initiation and pass through the threshold to make the transition from being a magister capable of teaching to being a doctor capable of adding to uh, knowledge of the world. Now, in saying all that, I know that there's a kind of elitism to all of that, and I don't mean to suggest that only people with PhDs add to that kind of a knowledge. Uh, that's clearly not the case. But, it, but the, the attainment of the PhD is nevertheless an initiation that recognizes 
that, that threshold has been crossed. Doctorates are awarded in recognition of, of uh, three things in particular, the creation and interpretation of new knowledge and original research, uh, which we usually recognize through the candidate's own writing. Those of you who've had a chance to look at what Travis has written, or will have a chance to look at what he's written in, in the future, uh, you'll recognize this immediately. It's an ex what Travis has produced is a really exquisite piece of work. Uh, it's rich, it's detailed, it's full of powerful argument, rich historical knowledge. It ranges from classical antiquity through, uh, through the Byzantine period into post-modernity. It engages in acts of uh, literary criticism down to a, a sort of minute analysis of the meter and form of Hopkins poetry all the way to the most abstract heights of speculative theology and philosophy. The doctorate it doesn't just recognize the creation and interpretation of new knowledge and original research, though. It also recognizes the acquisition and understanding of a substantial body of knowledge at the forefront of one's own field. Uh, you'll see Travis today, I think, engaging with many of these most cutting edge issues, cutting edge issues in uh, philosophy and theology, cutting edge issues in uh, contemporary ethical debates that have deep implications for how we understand our lives in the midst of a pluralistic and contested society, or how we understand our world in the midst of the emerging age uh, that some are calling the Anthropocene. And then finally, the doctorate is awarded in order to recognize the ability of the candidate to conceptualize, design, and implement a project for the generation of new knowledge. Uh, the, everyone who's done it knows what an ordeal it is to, to do this work. It's, uh, I don't think anyone goes through the process of writing a dissertation without, at times, encountering very deep sources of existential and emotional despair or crisis. Uh, it's, it's, it's a project that, that demands a tremendous amount of those who engage in it. Uh, and because of that, it demands a tremendous amount of forethought and um, forethought, rigor, and endurance. Uh, so part of what three of us are here today to do, those of us who sit on Travis's committee, is to look at, at that entire process and to evaluate it. So the dissertation is evidence of the candidate's capacity to conceptualize, design, and implement a project to generate new knowledge that will become part of the collective inheritance of human conversation, thought, speculation, uh, part of our exploration of the great mysteries of the universe. So this is not just a PhD defense, but also a powerful moment in a conversation that's been going on for centuries uh, and that will go on for centuries after us. Travis is in conversation with people who were writing and thinking powerfully and rigorously before any doctorates were ever awarded before master's degrees were ever awarded. He's entered into that conversation and he's adding his voice to it. So the three of us who uh, are here on Travis's committee uh, will finally be called upon to make judgments about what Travis has accomplished uh, after he's done his presentation and after we've had the chance to interact with him and ask him some questions, we'll retire to deliberate among ourselves and we can come back with a series of um, a series of responses. We can either pass the dissertation uh, with no amendments, just pass it as it is. We'll all sign, we'll all sign the papers today and, uh, and move Travis forward towards the reception of the PhD. We can pass the dissertation with minor revisions. Uh, this would mean there's a few things that need to be uh, tweaked uh, and, and Travis would just have to tweak a few things and then resubmit it to me and I would give the final uh, signature to pass it on. We could alternatively ask for significant substantive revisions that involves a, a greater work, at which point Travis would have to resubmit uh, the dissertation to all three of us. Or uh, we could uh, say, thanks for, thanks for trying, but here's, a, here's another master's degree. <laughs> so uh, those, are the, those are the various options. Uh, and after Travis's presentation and after we uh, engage with him in critical dialogue, 
the three of us will retire to deliberate which of those options to choose. Uh, to introduce the three of us, uh, let me just take a moment to uh, tell you a little bit about the other two sitting next to me, or in cyberspace, I guess. Uh, Travis's external committee member is Sam Mickey, who received his doctorate from, from CIS. Sam's a scholar, a teacher, and a writer in the environmental humanities. Uh, he focuses on ethics and the ontologies of non-humans. Uh, he's the author of quite a few works, the author and editor of quite a few works, including Whole Earth Thinking and Planetary Coexistence, Ecological Wisdom at the Intersection of Religion, Ecology, and Philosophy. He's the editor with Sean Kelly and Adam Robert of the Variety of Integral Ecologies. And currently with Mary Evelyn Tucker and John Grimm, he's editing Living Earth Community, Multiple Ways of Being and Knowing, which is going to be coming out in just a few months, so you can look for that. Sam teaches regularly in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at the University of San Francisco and also sometimes teaches for us here in PCC and CIS, as I think many of you will know. Um, and it's been a real pleasure to have Sam on the committee. Sean Kelly is also on the committee. Uh, Sean, all of you know, Sean is Professor of Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness at CIS. He's been with us uh, for over two decades. He's former chair of the department. Uh, Sean's an expert in the thought of Hegel and Jung, and also a leading thinker in the field of integral ecologies and, uh, and complexity theory. Sean's the author of Coming Home, The Birth and Transformation of the Planetary Era. Uh, some of you also know his individuation in the absolute, Hegel, Jung, and the Path Towards Wholeness. Uh, and uh, he's currently completing a new collection of essays that I know many of us are really looking forward to with the provocative title, Living in the End Times, Beyond Hope and Despair, reflecting on uh, many of the situations that we're facing in this sort of current moment of massive climactic and ecological change. And for me, uh, I think most of you probably know me, but I'm Jacob Sherman. I'm professor and chair in philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness. And I've been chair of Travis's committee throughout. I guess the one other thing I want to say before I hand it over to Travis uh, is that uh, the, the work that Travis produced for us, acting a part in the ecstatic love of the divine participation Energia and Person in Maximus the Confessor, Richard Carney and the Theological Turn in Continental Philosophy is actually just a portion of uh, a much larger work. Uh, it's almost as if there are multiple volumes to what Travis has created. In Germany, sometimes after you do a doctorate, it's, the doctorate is a terminal degree. So it's once you've done your doctorate, it, we're awarding you the highest degree that we can give. Uh, in Germany, they don't give you another degree, but they ask people to do a second work called a habilitation after the dissertation. Uh, and the habilitation is the, the moment at which uh, you become qualified to teach throughout the German university systems and things like that. It's a whole nother second volume, a whole nother work that you have to produce. Uh, Travis, I think, has actually written both a dissertation and a habilitation. <laughs> at the same time. And so it's, it's really pretty extraordinary to see how much thinking, how much writing, uh, and how much deep creativity have gone into this project. With that, I want to hand it over to Travis for the main event. Thank you all for coming. Travis, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much, Jake. I appreciate that. So I'd like to first thank my committee, both for overseeing my project, but also for their own academic work, which has informed my own. Jake Sherman, Sean Kelly, Sam Mickey, thank you guys very much. And I also wanna thank all my teachers and guides on all times, all planes. So let's get to it. This dissertation is about participation, a word I may never wanna hear again after this is all over. But participation is a way of describing the relationship between the world and its source. And we can think of the source as the divine or as a creator god or goddess. The source is where we come from and what we depend on to exist at all. So it's a question of how the world participates in the divine, which means how the divine grounds the world and makes it possible, but also how the divine is the animating force or lifeblood of things. 
So we could also call this the question of the one and the many, asking after that one condition which unites and grounds the many different things in the world. Rocks, daffodils, dragonflies, people, everything. Participation is ultimately about relationship. The relationship between the divine and the many beings in the world, but also the relationship among those beings themselves. What we can share with one another, how we participate in relationship with one another. So this brings out why the subject is important. It may seem like an intellectual indulgence to speculate as to our relationship with God, but what I really wanna bring out here is how our relationship to the divine can be a template for our relationships with one another. How what we believe about our relationship to God can consciously and unconsciously structure our relationships with other beings, and not just persons, but every being. So these aspects of participation and relationship are the most general context of our inquiry and our subject matter. More specifically and historically, the doctrine of participation is something that Plato first proposes as an account of the relation between the world and the divine. And this in response to philosophical problems in his predecessor's thought, problems that arise with the birth of philosophy itself about 200 years earlier. So the dissertation follows the idea of participation as it evolves through the ages, beginning at the birth of philosophy in pagan Greece in the 600s BCE, and tracing it over the next 1200 years or so to Maximus the Confessor, who lived in the Byzantine Empire in the 600s, and who's part of what we'd call the Eastern Orthodox or Greek Orthodox Christian tradition. Maximus represents a kind of climax or culmination moment in this continuous tradition of thought on participation. He synthesizes much of what came before him and he resolves some of the long-standing philosophical problems that are associated with this doctrine of participation. So this slide here shows the 1200-year uh, trajectory in question and mentions a few of the main philosophers that the dissertation treats. All right, so throughout this evolution, um, different types of participation emerge. So one thing that I've done is to catalog and categorize these different kinds and to develop a model as to how they relate to one another, which we'll explore a little bit more in just a minute. So about the first third of the dissertation introduces the problem and traces the historical background up to Maximus. The second third deals with participation in Maximus. And the final third of the dissertation brings Maximus's thought on participation to bear on some contemporary debates around how we relate to one another. Richard Carney is my main contemporary conversation partner here. And he serves as a bridge to some French phenomenologists such as Emmanuel Levinas and Jacques Derrida. And again, the main thrust is how our participation and relationship with the divine informs our relationships with each other. So as Jake uh, alluded to, I originally wrote about 700 pages on all of this. I cut that in half for the dissertation, and today I'll still only be able to share a taste of it with you. So please join me as I condense and distill years of work and hundreds of pages into about 40 minutes or so. So there are uh, three main things that I'd like to do today. Um, first, I want to set up some of the earliest philosophical problems to which Plato proposes the doctrine of participation as a solution, and to explain a little bit about how that solution works. Secondly, I want to present the main philosophical problems that emerge from the doctrine itself, the doctrine of participation, and how Maximus is able to resolve these. These problems are the paradox of participation and the problem of the origins of otherness, multiplicity. And finally, I'd like to show how Maximus's ideas on participation are relevant to some contemporary concerns around ethics and interpersonal relationship. So, we all know that philosophy asks the big questions. Questions like, what is being? Where did it come from? Where is it going? These were very pressing questions for me as an 18-year-old who was re-examining and doubting the Catholic faith that he grew up in. 
for me as for many of you, there were many countless nights that I sat pondering these things. And this dissertation emerges very much out of that personal journey for me, where Christianity collided with philosophy. And as you saw on that timeline, the dissertation covers where Greek philosophy collides with Christianity, both historically and on the level of ideas. So the first philosophers were natural philosophers, closer to what we would call scientists. And in their inquiries into being, they were inquiring into the physical world. So these first philosophers are known as the Milesian school, and they're seeking the arche, the one principle or substance that unites and explains the many things. So for example, Thales proposes water, and Eximenes proposes air. Thales saw that all living things need water, which is perhaps why he gave it a place of prominence. And Eximenes describes something like phase changes, explaining how air becomes the other elements when it's condensed or expanded. We could think more simply about how water can change from ice to liquid to vapor, but all three different phases are the same H2O. So these thinkers are trying to reduce the many things to a single underlying substance, to see the many differences in the world as transformations of some basic stuff. So their question is, what is this basic stuff? Anaxabander pushes back against Thales. He wonders, well, if everything is water, why isn't everything wet? But further, there's a logical difficulty with choosing the one arche from among the many things of the world. Because water and air are two of those many things that need explaining. So if everything is transformations of water, we would need recourse to a yet higher principle to explain water plus everything else. So instead of a single element for the basic stuff, Anaximander proposes something abstract, what he calls a peron, which means the indefinite or the unbounded. So this is a major step from natural philosophy to philosophy proper, a major step towards thinking transcendence. The peron is not one of the many things that need explaining, so it works well as the explanatory arche in that regard. But we have to ask, have we really explained much by recourse to something so vague as the indefinite? When we say that ice can become liquid water through heating, we seem to be explaining something about how the world works. But how does the one apeiron become the many things in the world? If we begin with something singular, how does it become many? Rock, daffodil, person. So this is the problem of the origins of otherness, the problem of how a one becomes many. Ultimately, the one principle which grounds the many things can neither be one of those many things that need explaining, nor can it be so foreign to them that the two have nothing to do with one another, as with the indefinite. So here, Parmenides offers a solution. He says that the one thing that the many share is being, that they are, they are themselves, they exist. So being is neither one of the many things to be explained, but nor is it absolutely foreign to them. Underneath all the differences and multiplicity and change of the world, of appearances and becoming, lies the one being, which Parmenides reasons is thus singular and always the same. The many are all variations on a single theme. That theme is the unvarying one being. Since this is the world's true ground, Parmenides reasons that all the world of change is an illusion. But here, we kind of end up back where we started. Because even if the world of the many things is in some sense an illusion, it's still there. And it's the thing that we were trying to explain in the first place. So in order to offer the explanation that the Milesians were looking for, two levels are needed, both world and source, both many and one. And they need to be distinct from one another and yet not totally dissociated. The principle can't be one of the many things to be explained, thus distinct, but neither can it be wholly different than the world, as was the Aperon, and finally, Parmenidean being as well. So Plato proposes participation as the manner in which the world is both distinct and yet joined to the one principle, both different from it and yet the same as it. To participate in something is to be a part of it, and thus the same as it to some degree. But there wouldn't be any sense in talking about participation if the participant were not also distinct from what's participated. 
and thus different. So what we have here is a, a complex and even paradoxical situation in which the participant is both the same as and different from the participated. And this is what I call the paradox of participation. And I try to capture this paradox in the title uh, in a, a wordplay. So the title here is acting a part in the ecstatic love of the divine. And if we just take the uh, acting a part portion, this obviously refers to participation and it can be read in two ways. It can be read as a part, two words, as in a part of something, or it can be read as a part, one word, as in apart from something. So this indicates that with participation, we always have the paradox that the participant is both a part of the participated, but also a part from it. And we'll return to explain the rest of the title. So for Plato, participation happens in the forms, which he calls the realm of true being. All the many appearances of our realm of becoming are grounded and united in the true being of the forms. For example, all the particular many horses partake of the one form of horse. This one form of horseness indicates what's the same across all the many otherwise different instances of particular horses. So this is meant to explain something about the world, that it seems to present itself like a theme in variations. There's a family resemblance amongst particular horses that they don't share with members of other species. So this works well among the many horses, they being explained by the one form of horse but what are we to do with the many forms? Horseness, frogness, humanness, but also beauty, justice. What unites and explains the many forms? So here the original question of the RK reemerges, but pushed back or up one level. And while the answer to this question is a bit ambiguous in Plato, Plotinus and the Neoplatonists will embrace and interpret this famous passage from the Republic, 509b, which describes the one beyond being. So with Plotinus, three levels are established. The many appearances of the world of becoming are united in the true being of the forms, and the forms are united and grounded in the one beyond being. So this proposes a, a vertical ontological hierarchy that's ultimately meant to explain what a thing is. Ontology is the study of being. Horseness refers to the animal's essence, while being a black or a brown horse would be a kind of variant in this essence. So this is a form of embedded participation. Embedded meaning that it's the very texture or fabric of being. It's a participation that happens automatically and typically unconsciously. There's no choice when it comes to a horse participating in hoarseness. Rather, it's that very embedded participation that allows the horse to be anything at all. The term embedded participation comes from Charlene Spretnik and our own Sean Kelly helpfully pairs it with the term inactive participation in his essay in the participatory turn volume edited by R. Jake Sherman and Jorge Ferrer, my work being very much a continuation of this research project. So while embedded participation is automatic and unconscious, inactive participation is a non-spontaneous, consciously willed participation. This is the way that I define the term in the dissertation though I want to acknowledge that this is a departure from the way it's used by folks like uh, Maturana, Varela, Evan Thompson. So we choose to inactively participate instead of it happening automatically. So an example of this from Plato would be participation in the forms through contemplation or teoria. Philosophers may consciously and actively engage with the mind those forms through which unconsciously they have their being in the first place. They inactively turn their mind back upon the fact of embedded participation itself. And this is a way of communing with the divine, of understanding the innermost nature of things, which is their divinity. So to just give a little analogy, maybe your 18 year old self has stared deeply into someone else's eyes, what Plato called the windows of the soul, and felt like you saw their innermost essence. This is perhaps a bit like platonic theory. So embedded participation in the forms offers an account of what we are by nature, while inactive participation in those same forms allows us to consciously and willfully engage them. So I'm gonna specify two types of embedded 
and two types of inactive participation. So we can call these first two embedded ontological and inactive epistemological participation. Ontology is the study of being, epistemology is the study of knowledge. We embeddedly participate in what we are and we inactively know what we are. So now let's isolate the second form of embedded participation. Beginning with the Neoplatonists and perhaps as early as Aristotle, philosophers start to differentiate what a thing is from the fact that it is at all. In later scholastic terminology, we could say that what a thing is has to do with its essence, like hoarseness, while the fact that it is has to do with its existence, that it's something rather than nothing. Because indeed, a thing has to exist before we can specify what kind of thing it is. So the second form, that a thing is, I call embedded existential participation, having to do with existence. The Neoplatonists will attri attribute this causation of being to the forms as well. So for them, participation in the forms is responsible both for what a thing is, embedded ontological, and that a thing is at all, embedded existential. These two senses of uh, embedded participation are somewhat fused in the pagan mind, in large part because of their belief in an eternal cosmos. So in an eternal cosmos, there's less urgency to explain how a thing came to be in the first place, and a bit more focus on what it is, its kind. But with the rise of Christian creation th theology, which inherits the Greek philosophical framework, the embedded existential sense is sharpened, all of creation is understood to have come into being through a free act of divine will. All of creation is understood in its contingency, in its dependence upon its creator, which is what gives it its existence. So now let's isolate the second form of inactive participation. While inactive epistemological is a way of knowing the divine forms with the mind, what I call inactive synergic participation is a way of consciously aligning one's actions with the divine. So there are two prime examples of this. Uh, the term synergic is adapted from St. Paul, and it has, its, uh, it has in it the root burgos, which means work, and the prefix sin, which like co, means with or together. So Paul speaks of us becoming co-workers with God, of joining our will to that of the divine in virtuous acts. He famously says, it is not I, but Christ who lives in me, who acts through me. So here it's not just the mind that engages the divine, but the whole embodied acting being. The second example is the theurgy of late Neoplatonists, such as Iamblichus and Proclus, in which the practitioner becomes a conduit for the divine work. So here the rituals and ceremonies of pagan religious practice enter into the philosophical fold and even displace contemplation as the primary means of joining oneself to the divine and achieving salvation. So now we're in a position to consider all, forms, uh, all four forms of participation and to coordinate them on a kind of vertical and horizontal axis. So the vertical axis of whatness has to do with ontology, the great chain of being. Embedded ontological participation explains what we are by nature, unconsciously, while inactive epistemological explains what we can, uh, how we can consciously know those same forms, how we can know the great chain of being. The horizontal axis of thatness has to do with existence through time. Embedded existential participation uh, explains that we exist at all and continue to exist that we were caused to be, while inactive synergic has to do with the choices that we make through time as historical beings and how we can consciously align our will with that of the divine. So this is the basic typology and framework which I use to analyze and understand the evolution of participation over this 1200 uh, year period. So, <clears throat> Having laid out the early philosophical problems to which Plato proposes the doctrine of participation as a solution, let's return to the problems that emerge from that doctrine. And these are the paradox of participation and the problem of the origins of otherness. 
So this paradox causes endless confusion over the years. And recall that this is the fact that the participant is both a part of and apart from the participated, both the same as and different from it. So some of the confusion has to do with how transcendence is understood. Catherine Tanner distinguishes between three ways of construing the relationship between transcendence and imminence in a univocal sense, contrastive sense, and a non-contrastive sense. So first, the univocal sense. Uh, to a significant extent for early Greeks, divinity is conceived as a kind of being distinct from others within the matrix of the same cosmos. So for Plato, for example, the forms are the inner reality of things. So divinity is a part of this world. This is in opposition to a simultaneous tendency to construe transcendence as the opposite of imminence. This is the contrastive sense. And so this is more like the caricatured interpretation we've heard about Plato and the two worlds, ours being a mere reflection of the real forms. This tendency is heightened in middle Platonism, which tends to posit a first or primary being that sits at the top of a cosmological hierarchy that stretches out below it. The divine is up there, apart from us, in contrast to us down here. With Plotinus and the one beyond being, the non-contrastive sense begins to emerge, with the one being understood as both nowhere and everywhere. It's not one of the many things in this world, but at the same time, it's present to all things as their sustaining ground of possibility. Now, the paradox of participation is just this non-contrastive sense. The one is a part of everything, and yet it couldn't be counted up alongside the things in this world because it's apart from them as their condition or source. God's not just in here or out there, but somehow both. So this is a metaphysically confusing state of affairs, to say the least. The univocal sense puts God in the world, while the contrastive sense dissociates God from the world. But the non-contrastive sense acknowledges a, an articulation or a hinge separating God and world, but that same articulation joins the two together. Throughout history, the tendencies will be to let the relationship slip off to either side, to collapse the complexity of the paradox, bringing God too much into the world and thereby undermining divine transcendence, or too much exiling God from the world and thereby undermining both the metaphysical explanation of participation as well as our ability to commune with the divine. So Dionysus is one of the first to really articulate the paradox clearly without mucking it up. And let me just read a couple quotes from Dionysus. So Dionysus writes, God is, as it were, beguiled by goodness, by love and by yearning, and is enticed away from his transcendent dwelling place and comes to abide within all things. And he does so by virtue of his supernatural and ecstatic capacity to remain, nevertheless, within himself. He is all things in all things, and he is no thing among things. He is known to all from all things, and he is known to no one from anything. The being of all things is the divinity beyond being. So in this last quote, uh, we hear that being is beyond being. So what were two metaphysical levels for the Neoplatonists become one. The one beyond being and the true being of the forms are joined in the one Christian God who is both participated and beyond participation. We are acting a part of and acting apart from since God is the participated that we as participants are paradoxically joined to and yet distinct from. So here I can explain my title a little bit further. Recall how the Dionysus quote refers to how, beguiled by love, God exercises an ecstatic capacity to go out of God's self and be participated, while yet remaining transcendently within God's self. So this is the ecstatic love of the divine, God's ecstatic love for creation, in which God gives God's self to be participated as the very being, life, and mind of all things. As participants, according to the paradox, we are a part of this ecstatic love and apart from it. 
So Dionysus is the first to really face the paradox head on and directly embrace it as paradox. What remains unexplained in Dionysus is how otherness and diversity emerges from the one God, how the many emerge from the one. If everything comes from God, what makes it different from God? If God's the very being, life, and mind in which creation participates embeddedly, what marks the creature in its otherness? Maximus will ultimately point to our free choice as the differentiator, closely connected to inactive participation, as I define it. So in embedded participation, we're given an ontological endowment. We are made to be. But in inactive participation, we have a choice as to what we do with this endowment. Maximus explains this through his theory of the Logoi, which give an account, the how, of our participation in God. Creatures participate in the divine in a unique way, which is what makes them what they are, all the way down to their particulars. So my logos would indicate my unique way of participating in God and thus being myself. Travis, in all his particularities, is a unique way of participating in the divine. This is what I am on the vertical axis of ontology. But the choices that I make and the things that I do with what I am are up to me and they unfold inactively on the horizontal axis of time and existence. Maximus sees the Logoi as a site of dialogue between creatures and the divine. It's as if what we are is a proposal from God to which we respond by living our life in a certain way. For Maximus, we can act in harmony with what we are and with God's invitation for our development, or we can act contrary to it, which for him constitutes sin in the fall. What's critical here is that Maximus has joined the vertical and horizontal axes, relating what I am, onto ont ugh, relating what I am ontologically to what I do existentially, historically, ethically, as a decision-making being in a world with consequences. And if any of this sounds too Christian for you, too much like obey or else, let me offer another way of thinking about it for any astrologically minded folks out there. It's as if my logoi are the astrological positions of the planetary archetypes. My natal chart represents a certain ontological endowment that I participate in, in embedded fashion in this life. While my higher self may have chosen my chart, from the perspective of this life that I wake up in, I don't remember selecting my chart. It's given to me and I can't change it. And while the chart doesn't dictate my choices, it does have an intelligence in terms of what my soul is trying to accomplish in this lifetime. My chart will never make me do anything, but if I refuse to face certain aspects of it, I'll stunt the plan for my soul's growth in this lifetime. For Maximus, this would be going against God's invitation, refusing to have the dialogue. Choice is what truly makes us different from God, what makes life not simply a preset program in which we're embedded, but choice is also what makes us capable of erring. But when we tune into this dialogue, when we harmonize ourselves to our charts, as I would say, Maximus says that we are divinized. We are made more and more like God. The divine comes through us more and more clearly because we attune ourselves to it and to its presence within us. This again is our acting apart in the ecstatic love of the divine. But here we can draw out the double genitive in the title. Before we noted how uh, the ecstatic love of the divine referred to God's love for creation. But we can also read the ecstatic love of the divine as our love for God when we choose to turn the ontological endowment of creation back towards its source in harmony with the divine. And the way we do this is through inactive synergic participation. By acting in concert with the divine through virtuous living, we achieve theosis or deific participation. We are made like God. Now what's interesting here and what connects Maximus to Richard Carney is that Maximus conceives of such virtuous acts as the broader incarnation of Christ. For Maximus, the incarnation is not just the specific Christ event, but a broader process uh, in which the divine is incarnating into and redeeming all things. So through inactive synergic participation, I am made like God, but God is also made like us, is incarnated. Every just act 
is the incarnation of Christ. So the double genitive in the title is meant to hold uh, both sides, us being made like God and God being made like us. And Carney calls this the God who may be. And what he means by that is that the kingdom of heaven is, is being built on earth when we manifest and make real our highest aspirations and our noblest ideals. Our ontological endowment, what we are, is first creation. And it's happened all around us, regardless of choice. But we have an opportunity for second creation to bring the divine deeper into this world through our willed ethical actions and creations of beauty. The God who may be is posited in contrast to the God who is and the God who is not. So the God who is, is the God of being, which can tend towards ontotheology and pantheism, overly identifying the divine with this world and losing its transcendence, cramming God into the categories of this world. Here I like to think of Aladdin's genie, phenomenal cosmic powers, itty bitty living space. So the God who is not, on the other side, is that of negative theology, which denies God is like anything in this world. God is not this, God is not that. Separating God and world and even sundering participation perhaps. So Carney tries to trace a middle path which is resonant with the paradox of participation. God is transcendent as the lure beyond this realm which draws us into dialogue around our logoi, as Maximus would say, draws us into second creation. But God is also imminent as what is being incarnated in every virtuous act. God is both a part of this world and apart from it. So now we're in a position to uh, try to explain a little bit of the relevance that this has for the contemporary conversation around interpersonal relationship. So in the wake of Heidegger's work, Emmanuel Levinas launches a strong critique of ontology and philosophical thematization. And his point is basically that philosophy and mind in general, in their quest to explain everything and put it into a system really do an injustice to the individual whose depths and mystery, in fact, defy system, defy neat, tidy explanations. So Levinas wants to bring attention to the violence of grand systems of thought in which the unique individual is leveled over and simply becomes a cog in a larger machine of history or being or some other grand narrative, perhaps not unlike historical Christianity. So to guard against such injustice, Levinas brings attention to the irreducible and eradicable otherness of another person, their alterity, which is another word for otherness. And Levinas claims that the alterity of the other is radical or absolute, meaning that we can never truly know the other, never overcome the divide between us. The danger of thinking that we can know the other is then thinking that we can know what is best for them, because knowing what is best for them can quickly become what is best for us. So by barring knowledge of the other, Levinas emphasizes an ethical imperative to try to do right by the other, even though our limited knowledge means we'll likely fail. So in the background here is Heidegger's tendencies or allegiance toward the Nazis, which I think we need to see not just as a personal quirk, but as something that arises out of his philosophy itself. The grand march of history through the epochs of being, taking precedence over the ethical injunction to respect the individual person. And it's not incidental, of course, that Levinas was a religious Jew. So if otherness is considered an absolute all or nothing affair, as in Levinas, then we're prompted to protect and to preserve the alterity of the other as one of our main objectives. We can't question the other since their otherness is absolute. So the appropriate response here is to maintain distance and respect for their alterity. And because of this emphasis on distance and respect, philosophies of radical alterity often promote justice as the model of relating to others. We can think of the old adage that good fences make good neighbors. So the problem with absolute alterity is that we lose our criteria for discerning between different sorts of others behind that fence. If every other is wholly other, then we have no way of telling the difference between an angel, a demon, or just a wrong number on the phone. And while this would be an advantage in some respects, eliminating the criteria upon which racism, sexism are based, for example, it's a disadvantage when it comes to really caring for the other 
in all their unique particularity. And that's because it's hard to do right by someone who we can't know. So for example, if someone has a nut allergy, then it certainly wouldn't be a kindness to offer them some peanuts, though in most other cases, it would. So while a totalizing knowledge of the other does an injustice to them by holding them too close and even using them to my own ends, so too, if I hold them too far away and can't know anything about them, it's hard to do justice to them as well. So what's called for is a complex understanding of how the other is both similar to me and different from me. And this is just what the structures and paradoxes of participation outline. So the model of participation that was developed with regard to the divine human relationship can help to illuminate the human human relationship. In contrast to Levinas's position is that of Carney, who claims that the alterity of the other is only relative and not absolute. If otherness is considered relative, then questioning and understanding the other isn't violent or impossible. Because the difference between me and someone else isn't absolute, there's no ethical injunction to protect and preserve their alterity. Instead, the injunction is to understand them better, since otherness is only relative, which makes that understanding possible. And this opens the way to intimacy and participation. So concern for bridging distance rather than maintaining it prompts many philosophies of relative otherness to privilege love rather than justice as the model of relating to the other. But this contrast between love and justice risks reinscribing the binary that the paradox was helping us to think our way out of. So I believe that a philosophy of relative otherness can hold both. And here, the alterity of the other is a crossing of sameness and difference from me. In some ways, I'll never fully know the other, but in other ways, I can get to know them better. We can share stories and explore common desires and values. So the idea is that we can still maintain the ethical advantages of absolute alterity, since some part of the other will always be inaccessible to me, and I must humbly sit before that mystery. If the only two choices were to absorb the other into myself or to keep them at a distance, then we would have to choose distance to try to achieve the ethical. But instead of an either or, I'm suggesting a kind of both and situation, as the paradox of participation suggests. If in addition to their withdrawn unknowable aspect, another person has some knowable aspect, as common sense suggests, then real communion with the other becomes possible through participation. So I want to acknowledge the danger here that the other's alterity could become swallowed by what I think I know about them, and even what I think is best for them. And this is why Carney insists on our hermeneutic vigilance, on the endless interpretations that shuttle between me and another as we attempt to understand and adapt to one another. And sometimes that will have to look like just leaving the other person alone. So another person is perhaps no less a mystery to me than the divine itself, but I hold out the hope that both can be participated in part, not in spite of ethical imperatives, but because of them. And while historically Christianity's violent imperial history cannot be ignored, I don't believe that participation necessarily leads to such a dominating assimilation. My own story led me out of Christianity through philosophy, and these days I have deep-seated concerns about both. I find myself more interested in cultivating relationships than understanding metaphysics. But what remains important, but what remains is the importance of inquiring into where we come from and where we're going, trying to make sense of the narrative of our lives that we live together. Thank you for being on this journey with me. I'm gonna turn it over to my committee now. Great, thank you. Uh, I'll go ahead and take the privilege of being the chair to ask a first question and then pass it over to Sean or Sam for our next question. Uh, if anyone, if, if Sean or Sam ever want to follow up on and put a second question immediately uh, to keep a conversation going, we can do that. But otherwise, we'll just sort of cycle uh, back and forth with one another until we feel sort of collectively that we're at a place, a good place. Does that sound okay to my other two uh, committee members? Great. Well, I want to start by uh, just thanking you, Travis, for your presentation and for your work. 
uh, this is really, it's, it's a formidable and, uh, and also really beautifully written uh, work. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some questions, hopefully some that will be tough. Uh, but I wanted to start by just acknowledging what also a pleasure it was to read uh, your, it's, anyway, it was, it's a, it's a real joy to get to, to engage with something that's written with feeling, insight, and elegance. Uh, the, I think the question I want to start anticipating some of what, um, I, have a, I have a little bit of a sense for where my examiners might go with some of their questions, although I'm never quite sure. The world is surprising all the time. Um, but uh, I want to focus myself on some of the more theological questions uh, that are raised in relationship to your use of Maximus uh, and what parts of Maximus you use and maybe what parts of Maximus you don't use. Uh, so the first one that, uh, that I think I want to ask is, uh, is about the role of the human. There's a number of times, it didn't come up as much in your presentation today, but there's a number of times in your dissertation when you acknowledge, uh, acknowledge a, certain, um, a certain centrality to the Anthropos, the human in Maximus's thought, uh, but you also seem to hold that in, there seems to be a, a tension in your relationship to that, uh, that through the through the concept of sort of deep incarnation and uh, the powerfully horizontal relational vision that Maximus enacts, uh, you're you're seeking to overcome some of that anthropocentrism. It seems to me, uh, but on my reading of Maximus, at least, uh, some of that some of that um, the, the centrality of the human is actually structurally important for him. Um, there's, a, there's a line from the mystagogy, which is, as you know, Travis, and, but for the sake of everybody else here, is, is this wonderful text in which Maximus sort of reads the entire cosmos as a kind of mystagogical uh, inaction on par with uh, what might be celebrated in a liturgy or something like that. And he, he says there, this is from chapter seven, he says, the whole world made up of visible and invisible things is a man. Uh, it means a human. In Greek, it's an anthropos. It's not an andros. So better translation would be a, a human. The whole world made up of visible and invisible things is a human being. And conversely, the human made up of body and soul is a world. So there's this powerful vision of, of um, microcosm and macrocosm. Uh, but I think it's really key for Maximus that that the human being has this macrocosmic capacity. It adds something to the universe that's part of how Maximus sees the whole thing uh, holding together. Now, we can develop that later, and, and there's some follow-up questions I want to ask about the relationship of Christ and Maximus's thought to that, but maybe the first question I want to pose to you, uh, based on this little way I've set it up, is to what extent is the role of the human uh, as a knower and as a being capable of engaging in these meditative, contemplative, uh, theurgic, effectively what you're calling uh, inactive participatory acts, uh, to what extent is the human being, does the human being occupy a, uh, a well, let's just call it a, a, a special place, a structurally special place? in your thinking, maybe, and also as you see it in, um, in your interlocutors? Yes. Um, well, certainly, certainly for Maximus, um, the first thing that comes to mind is the, the title of the Lars Thunberg uh, book, uh, Mic Microcosm and Mediator. And mm -hmm. for Maximus, there's no doubt that the, the human is at, is at the, at the the center of the plan for for salvation for for the universe and is is the mediator and is the one that that brings together uh, the different divisions and aspects of the world 
It's a moment where Maximus discusses Gregory's divisions, as I include in the dissertation, and talks about these different divisions between the earthly and the celestial and various divisions. And he places the human at the center of all these. And because the human partakes of the above and below, the human is the one who can, who can bring together all of this. And in that sense really is the, the steward of the cosmos in a way. And I feel like the, 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 the sense of anthropocentrism is, is lessened by this kind of holographic quality that you're talking about. It's, it's not just that the human is at the center, but there's these kind of fractal echoes that go out that in, in, all, in all directions we see this patterning, but it's almost like we're, we're sitting at the center and that's where we're seeing it from. Hmm. So I can, I can, I sort of warm, warm up to Maximus in that way that it, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel like the privileging of the Anthropos is just that we're the, we are the crown of creation, but we're the, we're the center in a sort of reflecting crystal of kind of see Indra's net kind of patterns going mm -hmm. out. Um, and I think a good way to hold that for me in our time is that so much depends upon us in the Anthropocene. So much is on our shoulders. It really is in our hands whether this planet will certainly move into devastation or will some fraction less than total devastation. Um, and so I think taking the message in that way in our time, you can sort of turn this anthropocentrism and say, well, whether or not we are a, a crown of creation or a center of creation, at this moment in time, it's up, it's up to us in a large way what's going to happen moving forward. Mm -hmm. That's one way that I hold the anthropocentrism in Maximus. So is that, on that second point, Yeah. Okay. So, you, so you're make, if if I heard you rightly, you're making the argument that that um, it, it seemed to me that your that your response there is sort of bracketing the cosmological question, and it's it's almost a sort of historical argument that now, at least on this planet, at least uh, human beings have become, uh, you know, as Bill McKibben says at one point, the gatekeepers of nature. Uh, I think we can we can at least certainly say that. Are you, and are are you asking further? What's what's my personal opinion on on that's on that centrality of anthropos and on the on the cosmological level yeah but what but i mean i also don't want to denigrate it as your personal opinion it's you it's your informed reflective uh <laughs> educated thought yeah well i i think you know in looking at i mean a, a big part of the emergence of inactive participation has to do with the choice and free will and self reflexivity of the human, mm -hmm. which as far as we know on this planet, we're the only creature who engages in that to the, to the same, to the same, do, in the same way and to the same degree. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it does seem to me that there's a certain, a certain responsibility and centrality because we seem to be at some cusp of, of the evolution of the species on this planet. It's not to say that that evolution won't stretch beyond us. It almost certainly will. And it's not to say that in other places uh, we aren't less advanced. But I mean, it kind of, that kind of turns back to the historical. I, I would say, yeah. yes, we have a, privi a privileged place cosmologically, but we're still only a moment in time. And, and I see that evolution stretching forward. And I, when right. I imagine other other planets, other beings, that would certainly take our, our centrality down a peg. Mm -hmm. But within mm -hmm. the context of our, of our planet, it does seem to be the case. Mm. Yeah, it might be that history and cosmology shouldn't be thought of in that kind of bifurcated manner uh, that I set it up as. So. <laughs> uh, I'll hand it over to... Uh, I'll hand it over to uh, one of my colleagues okay, now, but I have more questions to come. <laughs> <clears throat> well, thank, thank you, Jake, because it, it follows immediately on this. Um, but let, let me also begin, uh, Travis, by uh, expressing my gratitude. Well, first of all, my, 
deep uh, praise um, and um, you know, astonishment, really, at uh, what you have produced um, in terms of its depth, uh, depth of thought, range of scholarship, um, mastery of craft, of uh, thinking, of inquiry, and you know, down to the level of, well, the structure of the whole, but down to the level of every paragraph and sentence, there's a, there's a care and, um, uh, and mastery, you know, at, at so many levels that um, is rare and uh, is such a privilege and a delight as a committee member to, you know, to participate in that. So I just, I just want to thank you uh, and praise you uh, at that, you know, most general and multi-leveled uh, perspective. Um, and, you know, of course, I, I, I'm particularly impressed as well by your central argument, your central claim. Uh, um, I, I knew nothing about Maximus the Confessor before. Now he, he's one of my heroes, <clears throat> for sure. Uh, and I find myself, uh, found myself throughout reading uh, the text and um, hearing you speak, just inwardly nodding in agreement. Yeah, that, you know, that matches my uh, deepest commitments, my uh, so much of my own reflection. So I, I really feel at home in the world that you have uh, helped reveal and and, and illuminated uh, and contributed to. So thank you, Travis. Um, and there's more in terms of uh, what you know what I've learned from the, 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 that that might come out later. But just to go immediately to a question, while uh, your um, dialogue with Jake is still fresh in our in our minds, uh, and it has to do, you know, as you know, in, in our exchanges with the distinction between embedded and, and an active participation. But relating that to the question that Jake posed about the status of the human, um, so from your response, I hear you open to a kind of you know, complex or relativized view of the human in a broader cosmological uh, context. And yet the, the way you define uh, the distinction between embedded and an active participation, uh, you, um, you reserve unconscious participation for embedded and conscious participation for an active, more or less. Uh, and as you noted in your, your introductory comments, you are departing somewhat from, from Maturana, Varela, and Thompson and their uh, use of an action, the inactive paradigm, as it were, which they base on, on basic you know, cellular organization. So uh, living organization all the way down to the most rudimentary uh, form, the single cell, they say uh, is inactive um, so that the, the physical organization of the cell can't be separated from its uh, cognitive act, uh, which is both um, in a sense perceptual or receptive interaction with the, the world in which it's embedded, uh, to which it, it creates and it co-creates in its sort of um, primordial cognitive act of self-organization. So an action for them is there from the beginning. Uh, and from our perspective is unconscious. But, um, you know, from other perspectives, uh, you know, many people have proposed a kind of panpsychist or spectrum model where it's conscious all the way down, but relative to us, the consciousness of a cell is admittedly very um, much simpler and primordial. And so we could say that it's functionally unconscious. So what I'm getting at here is, uh, <clears throat> why are you open to acknowledging a um, sort of epistemological inactive participation all the way down, um, even though you know it would be of a much simpler uh, grade than uh, than the human <clears throat> on the one hand mm. and also uh, 
would you recognize a conscious embedded participation? So uh, yes, embedded participation is there. It's our endowment. It's sort of the default mode. And um, for most people, including myself, it's unconscious. But I can make it conscious. And the, one of the ways we do that is by, <clears throat> in a religious context, for instance, is expressing gratitude and thanks and praising uh, creation, for instance. So that, to me, would be a form of conscious embedded participation. So if you can extract, uh, I'm not sure what the specific question here would be. Maybe it would be, uh, all right, so do you see that your characterization of the distinction between embedded and inactive participation, in a sense, presupposes and, and reinforces a more traditionally anthropocentric, less um, panpsychist uh, uh, view than the one that you're than the one that the weight of your project is actually trying to endorse. See that last part just again? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you see how your, your distinction of, uh, your, your linking of embedded uh, participation with, um, let me see that. Unconsciousness. Unconsciousness, yeah. And, and sort of reserving an active participation right. to the conscious side might reinforce unnecessarily yeah. the the kind of uh, restrictive anthropocentrism that Jake highlighted, which is actually in tension with uh, a more complex and and uh, cosmologically incarnational view of anthropos that the the weight of your project uh, so beautifully um, uh, suggests and uh, celebrates. Yes, so I'd say I'd say I'm, I'm certainly open to to the to the panpsychist approach and um, feel feel very resonant with it. I, I think I think in, in in part the way a lot of the historical thinkers thought about themselves structured some of the ways in which I was I was approaching it. I was really trying to draw this this through line uh, from from Plato contemplation of the forms through Paul and theurgy to to Maximus and showing how there's a kind of e evolution of and and deepening of the inaction that's that's happening there and i think also the project was framed a lot uh, as this relationship between being and mind which is thematized quite a bit in the introduction and i hear what you're saying these aren't the helpfulest uh, differentiations but if we if in a traditional way, we differentiate between being and life and mind, which you're suggesting are perhaps more more so in a spectrum. But it was it was as if the the dissertation focused more on the the being side and the mind side and how how they met, and less about the life that's happening in between. The the more uh, the more traditional use of of an active would have a little bit uh, be a little bit more familiar in the organic biological context. Um, so I think in, in part the way that some of these thinkers thought about it themselves, I was trying to figure out the through lines and how they could, they could be joined to one another. But I think especially if the, the history that I traced w would continue to be traced into, you know, into the modern and through later figures like Schelling and Jung, um, that's some of some of these distinctions that I made would would need to would need to break down, but because I, I do think there is a, a conscious embedded participation. And I think in part I was calling that inactive epistemological because I think as you mentioned in uh, early comments on my proposal, to call uh, contemplation of the forms inactive is pretty minimally inactive compared to how some later people are going to think think of inactive. But there's but there's an there's an active consciousness there um, so I did I did want to open up how how we engage but I think that ultimately if we could smooth smooth out some of those those divisions it, it would be interesting to to take it in a more panpsychist direction and on the other side, so you said con uh, a conscious form of embedded and right, an unconscious form of inactive. 
we've also talked about as in archetypal projection, which I think would be another thing that would be thematized more if, if the history was taken into the modern. And so I think, you know, applying a, a late antique framework to postmodernity without any consideration of what happened in between has some drawbacks. But we can only do so much. And I was try, uh, trying to do justice to some of these folks on their own terms to some degree without pulling them out too much out of their context. So I think those are a few of the considerations that are at work, but I really like the directions that you're pointing in and some of the ways that this could open up further. Yeah. Go ahead, John. Oh, is he muted, Jess? Here, I'll unmute you. Maybe you have to accept it, Sean. Okay, got it. Well, thank you, Travis. That, that uh, makes a lot of sense to me. Um, perhaps, uh, you know, perhaps uh, though in, the, in the, the dissertation, you might even in, in, in a footnote acknowledge that um, of course one can, one can imagine or conceive of uh, uh, both unconscious and active participation uh, which we see in, in psychological projection all the time, mm -hmm. um, for instance, uh, and a conscious embedded participation. Uh, but uh, that you know, you are you in a sense are focusing on the the uh, prototypical and exemplary uh, in, in extremes of each of these kinds of participation. Right, and, I, and part of that was because because I'm tracing this problem of the origins of otherness. And one of Maximus's main solutions is the free choice right. of, of the human. I'm trying to give kind of like what ran up to him being able to thematize free choice and free will. Maximus was one of the first to really give us our concept of the will as we know it. And so I, I think I kind of privileged a little bit that anthropic approach because that's the solution to the problem of the origins of otherness that I'm tracing. But I acknowledge the, the limitations, and especially the limitations if we were to transfer such a model into a contemporary context any more so than I've done here. Okay, well, I, I don't want to monopolize, and, and I, I have obviously a lot more that I would love to be uh, uh, in conversation with you about. But let me just say that I, I don't think that it's a limitation, really. But, and it could, it could easily be um, addressed just in terms of making explicit that, okay, um, you know, I acknowledge that such and such is the case, but you know, mm -hmm. this is what I'm focusing on and, and for these reasons. And that could be done very, very, uh, very easily, I think. It, 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 it in no way touches the, uh, the soul and core or, or substance of, of, um, of your argument. Um, I, I have so much more that I want to say, but I want to give uh, Sam a chance. Uh, Thank you very much, John. I was sitting here wondering, is Sean? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I want to reiterate uh, all of the praise that everybody else has already said. Um, it's, you know, it's beautiful work. I enjoyed reading it a lot. And uh, especially, I don't know, taking an approach to these issues where you really defend transcendence um, in, in a non-contrastive sense of transcendence, but that's, you know, that's not like a hip thing to do. The trendy thing is everybody's defending imminence and just criticizing transcendence for being all hegemonic and horrible. Uh, so I thought, you know, there's a certain amount of courage to come out and say, no, hold on, maybe not all transcendence is bad. It's not a question of whether there's transcendence in your model, but maybe what you do with it, and how you interpret it. Uh, so I think that's great. It's a great contribution uh, to the field and the way you integrate the theological turn and French phenomenology really, really good. Um, my question in terms of anthropocentrism is kind of the uh, other direction. I'm worried that it's actually uh, people like Maximus aren't anthropocentric enough um, because the anthropos they're talking about is primarily a Christian human and, uh, and like pagans and non-Christians aren't necessarily uh, kind of interpreted on their own terms, right? I think there's some point in the dissertation where you talk about how uh, pagans had some kind of sense of non-contrastive transcendence, but it's really creation theology that sharpens that, right? And that kind of brings it into its own, which falls into kind of developmental models that pagans are somehow immature and Christianity is required for their maturation. 
And then I think, I mean, creation theology, we're talking about creatio ex nihilo, which historically was used to justify genocide, right? When you think of the colonization of Australia and the doctrine of terra nullius, right? No man's land. Uh, it's the same kind of justification, right? This land is nothing. Uh, there is, it's nihilo, right? And only with the presence of Christians can we like civilize the savage land. So the kind of universalizing moves that Christians do, right, this universal anthropos, it turns out that it's really not that universal. And uh, the way even just calling pagans pagans, right, the term has a pejorative uh, use, like its origin is derogatory, it's just referring to like country folk, right? So I, I love the interpretation of, uh, of Christian theology that you're providing here, but I wonder how it deals with the conflict of interpretations. So how does uh, what you're saying relate to indigenous worldviews or pagans, let's say, or to Jews, um, right? Jews uh, are often just kind of a foil for Christianity, hence that weird prefix Judeo-Christian, right? So if, if we're living in a time like the Anthropocene where humans coming together and developing globally coordinated solutions to global problems is really at stake, then how uh, would this kind of Christian vision fit with non-Christians or with Christians who just have different interpretations of things. Uh, so how do you deal with that kind of conflict of interpretations? We have like seven and a half billion people on the planet and only a couple billion of those are Christians. Sure. I mean, I, I hope that, you know, at least part of what I've developed isn't restricted totally to a Christian context. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I recall you saying, you know, the, the, Non, non contrastive sense uh, non contrastive theology catherine tanner it's a it's a Christian theology, but it does seem like i think the not the non contrastive sense is is present before christianity and yes, we want to avoid a, a kind of developmental model, but I feel like the the paradox of participation it's it stretches it stretches wider than just than just a, a Christian worldview and that I do think that we have a, you know, a kind of basic structure of, of relationship that when you're, when you're dealing with how, how we meet another, it doesn't feel like it's, it has to only, only be, only be Christian there. And I don't, I don't know that the Jewish and Christian lines can be drawn the same as the radical alterity and the participatory line. I think it's easy to think, okay, well, you know, if you're pushing participation, you're pushing something Christian. But, you know, someone like Caputo is a Christian, but he goes in for radical alterity. And if we, you know, think of someone like Bo Buber or Rosenweig, their, their models of intersubjectivity don't go nearly as far as Levinas goes with alterity. And so I, I mm -hmm. hope that my championing of participation isn't a covert championing of Christianity and my modifying of radical alterity is a covert rejection of Judaism. I don't know that we can, you know, just lump, lump those two sides together. But I think that we have to be constantly vigilant about what these, what these philosophies are serving because universalism, as, as great as it sounds, isn't as great as it sounds, it turns out. Um, yeah, and really, and, and to your credit, I think uh, you bring up all the right uh, theorists to address those issues. Mm -hmm. And so, um, like Myra Rivera, right, makes a, a nice appearance in the dissertation. And so you bring up liberation theology, which does such a good job of framing these kinds of conflicts and saying, well, how do we be Christian in a more multicultural and pluralistic context? Right. How do we be Christian in a way that makes sure we're serving liberation and not oppression and that kind of thing? Uh, so they're in there. And uh, I, I kind of just wanted to see more of a fight. I'm like, Myra Rivera showed up. All right. Oh, she's going to give people the business. And then she's going to give people the business too much. Uh, or likewise, Catherine Keller is another one. You bring mm -hmm. Catherine's work up. Uh, and she's somebody who would definitely cause a little trouble. She'd cause a little bit of a ruckus. And uh, was like her face of the deep, for instance, uh, being very critical of the idea of creatio ex nihilo and kind of giving her own alternatives of creation out of the deep, right? Ex profundis. Um, so those were things that I, you brought up and, and kind of like you put those walls up to say, hey, here's the, here's the sign. This is a limit. Christianity has to deal with this. We have to think about these issues, feminist issues, LGBTQ issues, indigenous issues. 
Uh, but then I didn't see the fight as much as I wanted to. Um, sure. And kind of like, it was kind of like you were burying the lead. Because really, I think you have very creative answers to that problem, um, but kind of smoothed it out a little too much, right? Mm -hmm. So like, I want to see, uh, you know, a little bit more of a fight. It can be a very polite fight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but to show that somebody like Myra Rivera and her sense of, you know, the poetics of the flesh, that she would push back on some of these readings of, uh, of theology from antiquity and things like that. So, you know, staging the debate more. I like non-contrastive transcendence, but I want to see more contrast between different interpretations of that, right? Yeah, I think I was, you know, I didn't want, so much of my research went into the historical piece and the historical Christian piece. And at a certain point, I, I kind of said, well, I can't, you know, I can't just do a, you know, do a dissertation on Christianity. And I think that's a, you know, part of, part of what prompted bringing some of these figures in. And I would be happy to to hear of more of a ruckus too, but I think I reached reached certain limitations uh, in terms of length and all all that all that one can do. But I hope that the the push for participation I want it to be a uh, to support the the encounter with the other, and that ultimately that the encounter with the other it's not something that you know. Well, you you know. You better participate with me in the way that I want. I'm, I'm hoping that what I was suggesting is a genuine encounter with the other. And even if that wasn't always spelled out and at the forefront of the dissertation, I think when, when we look closely, if we're going to really be with another and all their unique particularity, their unique particularity can be the ways that they're marginalized and the ways that they suffer. And to participate in their suffering with them, to participate in solidarity with those people, and for me, this kind of vision leads leads to that kind of ethic and ethic of care, even if it's not uh, always spelled out at the forefront of the dissertation. Can I can I follow up on that with um, uh, one more question? That's that actually I think directly relates to it. And um, I, I already said this, and I, I won't I won't um, reprise all the commendations that each of us have for it it's um but this when you switch from doing antiquity from dealing with antiquity to engaging uh 20th and 21st century philosophical concerns it's it's really a pretty masterful switch in that uh it it feels natural in the course of the the dissertation at least it did to me and that's uh that's pretty extraordinary because you're leaping a lot of centuries there and um uh, and it's a it, it's a powerful performance. One of the arguments you make in thinking about uh, the ethics of radical alterity versus relationality is is you uh, you reconstruct the arguments that Carney and others have made that uh, a complete ethics of radical alterity ends up unable to provide a why for its preference or privileging of justice, um, uh, solidarity, uh, liberation, emancipation, and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. um, that, that, that if the other is, if the other is completely other than, then my relationships to the other are also completely other. And there's a kind of radical homogenization so that it, all relationships become the same and choosing Levinas or Nietzsche is, becomes merely a kind of voluntaristic act as opposed to one that can be motivated. Now there are, there are responses that are going to come from the thinkers of radical alterity who think they have reasons for saying that justice is undeconstructible uh, above and beyond that. But it's, it's a sophisticated argument. Zizek makes a similar argument with respect to Kant, right? Uh, that that Kant's, um, Kant's categorical imperative uh, can be inverted into Sadianism and so forth. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I was looking at your reconstruction of that, though, I didn't fully, while I, I agree with, I, I agree and I'm really moved by your account of an ethics of um, relationality, otherness in relation, uh, I wasn't entirely certain that I saw your own account for the, th that would motivate the choice for the good, right? The, the sort of meta-ethical argument for why the good is to be preferred over 
uh, over something else. <laughs> I mean, in one sense, it's, it's, I guess, ontological in that we're bound up with one another. Uh, but being bound up with one another is, is sometimes really horrible and issues in uh, really terrible relationships rather than emancipatory and, and liberative ones. And this is a this is a two part question. So one is is what is the motivation for you there? And then the second part of it is more historical and theological. And it's it's that in contrast to Sam's um, concerns about uh, I, I think legitimate concerns about Christocentrism, I also kind of want to push for a little more Christocentrism. In that uh, for Maximus, uh, I think those questions about ethics are answered precisely by the life and death of Christ. So that Maximus' account of what does God look like is God looks like a human being who comes and lives in such a way that he gives his life and death for others, right? It's not that, that the incarnate one dies as a human and is then resurrected because he's secretly God, Waha! but it's, it's more that Maximus is saying he dies this way because he is God. He dies this way, giving his life for the sake of others, right? It's, it's an answer to the question of radical alterity and relationship, precisely in that the ethical shape of the life. And that's really important to Maximus uh, for the entire, prog the entire sort of ascetical and mystagogical program that he undertakes, and also he undertakes in his life, uh, ending as, as mm. the confessor, uh, because he, he refuses to bow to power, right? Anyway, so that's, that's the two-part question is, is, one, what motivates the turn to the good uh, in your account? And two, uh, should we think also more about, about the sort of Christological role in Maximus, not just cosmologically, but in this, um, uh, in this, um, pedagogical and, and formative way. Yeah. So um, one thing that comes to mind, uh, yes, as, as you kind of alluded to, we're all, you know, we're all here together. We're all in this together. We're trying to, to, to get through this with one another. And, you know, one direction I go is, you know, a little bit a psychological developmental direction that, we're, we're hardwired for attachment to one another. We're, we're social beings, you know, our, our species has, you know, one of the longest periods of parental care and, and deepest and just, you know, we are kind of wired to be both, you know, dependent and independent from one another and to try to figure out how to navigate that in a healthy way and it seems like our happiness depends upon us learning how to navigate, not being, you know, too dependent or independent from one another. And so I think that in that sense, the, you know, the good is us trying to find a way to be good with one, with one another, because my, you know, my happiness is if, if I'm attached, if I'm deeply attached to my, to my caregiver, my parent, my happiness is dependent upon their happiness. And that is a kind of template for how we go out into the world, into relationship with one another. And it seems like there's a, you know, a, a network in place that we, we, we achieve the good by, by doing good to one another. And that if we, if we don't do that, it seems like no one ends up happy. It's not like I could just kill all of you and then I'd be the happiest. It seems, seems like that isn't the case, you know? The, pe the people at the top don't seem, you know, those kind of people at the top don't seem happy. And so f for me, it seems like the situation that we're thrown into and in being together is some kind of orientation towards the good, mm -hmm. even a transcendent orientation is, seems to be wired into who we are and what the setup is here, being together. And that's why, you know, I, I push back against the Zizekian flip um, it's one answer I would give to the, to the first part of the question. Um, second part about, uh, a little bit more Christocentrism. Yes. So 
I mean, I love Maximus's vision that the, the, inc the incarnation was, was God's plan from the beginning mm -hmm. and that this, this self-emptying is, is the nature of deity. And it kind of seems like there's a, for me, it's connected. There's a, there's a relationship there from the beginning that is, it's just in God's nature. I mean, it's like the Dionysus quote that God's nature is this kind of ecstatic doubling. And so the nature of, and, and we see it in, in Christ, of course, there's a, you know, it's a kind of ecstatic doubling of God and this crossing over with humanity. And so I think that, uh, yeah, it's, it's fair to, to, to thematize, thematize that more and to bring a little bit more Christocentrism into the picture. I think, I think you have a wonderful line in there where you, you say that, um, what do you say? Uh, is it Christology is functional cosmology? Is that what, uh, or, or functional ontology maybe? Functional, it's something like that. It's, I mean, it's a, it's a play on Thomas, Bay, Thomas Berry's ecology is functional cosmology, but um, the, uh, the, I think the reason why I bring up the, the Christology here is, is because that Christology becomes, at least for Maximus and for the tradition he's working in, for the Christian tradition, it, it becomes precisely that point in which all the sort of cosmological and speculative gets radically performed right. in, in a sort of moral and in the shape of a moral and ethical life. Uh, and I think the kind of concerns that Myra Rivera and, and Sam or Kath, uh, Catherine Keller might raise, I think are often attached to, um, I think often, often they're attached to cosmologizing speculative theologies that don't make the life and death of Christ so central. Whereas mm -hmm. the, the sort of approach of liberation theology has been really to thematize the life and death of Christ. Uh, and oftentimes these two are put in juxtaposition against one another. Uh, but I think there's an opportunity in the kind of leveraging of the, cosmo of the cosmological and the speculative for emancipatory ends that you're seeking to bring them more radically together. Uh, anyway, that's- Yeah, no, and I think as you pointed out, uh, you know, the, the example of Maximus's life himself, mm -hmm. you know, he, he, he gave his life for the specific he, vision he had of Christ's you know, ontological composition. And it seems, it seems kind of strange at first that some, you know, mm -hmm. oh, these, these seem like theological quibbles, but, but what's at, you know, what's at stake is this crossing of the uh, human and the divine. And if, if Maximus is willing to, to die for it, it seems like hmm. he's not, he's not, he's certainly not holding his ontology or his theology in a, you know, dominating political sort of, sort of way. And I think that gives us insight into what his, his real values were and to hmm. how, how some of this might be applied. Interesting. Thanks, Travis. So how are we doing for time? Do we have time uh, and energy for, for more questions? As much as you want. Yeah, it's, it's up to you. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, go for it if you're up for yeah. it. Okay, well, this is this, it's a complex thought. I'm not sure how well I'll, I'll articulate it, but um, there's several pieces. Like one is, uh, you know, reading uh, the dissertation, uh, sometimes it was not clear to me, is this, Travis's first person voice mm -hmm. or is is this Travis skillfully taking on uh, the prosopon the, you know the, the mask the face of the um, the theological tradition that he is um, uh, you know enacting before us and um, you know because the like one one paradigm of scholarship of course the still dominant one is that uh, we take a third person perspective on these traditions and we consider them merely as text and we, you know, we, we do our thing with the text, but we bracket our own uh, personal existential, even, you know, theological commitments. 
Um, and it, it um, honestly, I get the impression reading your text that no, this is not just a third person disengaged um, text, that Travis is actually coming from, and there are moments in the text where it, it sounds like you're speaking as a Christian, or if we don't want to say that, you're, you're at least speaking in a way that to me, performatively, if not explicitly, uh, argues the case for the, the necessity of a theological discourse of a, we could say, mythopoeic, symbolic discourse uh, as essential for um, articulating and communicating the participatory vision that you're advocating. And um, so that's the first part. It's related to the second part, which uh, comes from my relationship to Hegel. You know, like in, in, in this, obviously you couldn't do everything. You already did, you know, three dissertations in, in one. But in, in the genealogy that you trace, where you go from the pre-Socratics all the way up to, to Maximus, Maximus, and then you leap as, as uh, masterfully, as Jake said, to uh, contemporary, you know, sort of postmodern theologians and so on. To me, the big missing component that is obviously Hegel, right? Um, not only, in fact, in terms of the genealogy of, of you know, Heidegger and Levinas and um, um, uh, Kearney, so on, the, the, the structures that they're using in their, their discourse were first, you know, came together in Hegel. And in fact, the, the, the um, what happened right after Hegel, you know, you have, so Levinas to Heidegger is a replay of Kierkegaard to Hegel, you know, right. where, where Kierkegaard is, is, at, is saying, no, there's no system, we have to, anyway. Right. So, um, but what Hegel does, and I'm almost finished in my exposition here, <laughs> bear with me. Uh, Hegel, as, as you know, um, actually argues for the uh, intrinsic superiority of Christianity over other religious epiphanies, and he calls Christianity the absolute religion. Precisely because, as I feel you demonstrate in your dissertation, the, the very categories of his system uh, could not have come about without this prior in a sense of uh, religious and theological engagement, um, the meaning of which Hegel translates out of the theological discourse into the system of philosophy, okay? So there's two things happening here. On the one hand, Hegel's claiming that there really is an intrinsic sort of um, uh, uh, privileging required of the Christian tradition in order to understand the very discourse, the logos, the account that he is giving. And you seem to be doing something similar. So I, I guess my question mm -hmm. is, um, uh, could you, you know, if you had time and money and so on to, to do the most complete version of the project you're undertaking, uh, <laughs> one, what would you do with Hegel and, and not just Hegel in particular, but what would you do with the Hegelian problem of, uh, of um, you know, do we, do we, do we take the right-wing Hegelian view where we have to say that, no, we, we have to preserve theology and in, and in fact honor the centrality of the Christian uh, tradition in birthing the paradigm that we're doing? Or do you take the left-wing Hegelian response and say, no, we get rid of theology and we, we, we work with purely anthropological and maybe cosmological categories, uh, which would lead to, you know, a satisfying Sam among other people, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, first, first I'd say there is a um, a certain unique as, uh, aspect to the to the approach. But I mean, what's what was so interesting for me about uh, sorry, what's so interesting was so interesting to me about Maximus is because it, it resonated so much with my own beliefs, but not my own beliefs in a Christian way. I think for, for a long time, I've considered myself not, not a Christian. Um, and I was, I mean, I was, I was led into all this stuff 
I was led into this because of Derrida's engaged, Derrida and Marion's engagement with Dionysus is what started this. And then I kind of went down the Dionysian rabbit hole and that ended up leading to Maximus. But not because it resonated with my own Christian views, but because it resonated with my feelings about what's actually going on here metaphysically. And so I, th I think that connects to your second part of the question that to some degree, I agree with Hegel that Christianity is onto something in terms of certain metaphysical structures, but I think it's kind of getting, getting the story backwards to say that then we have to privilege Christianity as the privileged religion. I think Christianity kind of hit upon something for me that's, that's more, more basic and that this, you know, this crossing of, of divine and, and, and manifest for me is, is the basic structure that's most important. And Christianity seems to articulate it the best in terms of the religions that I've engaged with and I haven't engaged much with Eastern traditions. So I don't claim any exhaustiveness there. So when we, and I think that the way that Maximus articulates his Christology, for me, it's just the, the best articulation of it I've, I've read. And so I was, I'm so excited by the structures of the ideas, but I have no personal allegiance to Christianity and I certainly don't have any personal allegiance to the, to the actual incarnation of Christ event. So it's kind of a funny, it's a funny feeling for me to identify so much with, with the philosophy and, and parts of the theology without it being my own faith. Um, but I think it touches a deeper faith in me and that was kind of the faith that philosophy led me to in the first place when I, when I kind of put Christianity down as a, as a young person. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of feels like I'm coming full circle and being able to appreciate Christianity in a, in a way that I couldn't then and see, you know, see, see, something, see something good in it. Because on the other, the reason that I rejected Christianity in the first place was for a, a lot of the reasons that, that Sam brings up these, I mean, these large scale oppressions, but for me, it, at a young age, it was, you know, why can't women be priests? Why are, you know, my Jewish friends and gay friends going to hell? This, you know, this makes zero sense. But, I mean, of course, we could talk about this all day. Okay, these are, you know, perhaps, you know, t you know temporal aspects of the current state of, you know, the Catholic Church and, and other aspects of Christianity and not the, the deeper Christianity. But... So I think within the, within the dissertation, I was speaking from a personal place, but it wasn't a, a personal Christian confession. It was a, a personal faith in the sort of deep structures of the divine and the sort of deep cosmological aspects of what Maximus puts forward. And so I would, I would disagree with Hegel uh, that that gives Christianity a place of prominence among religions. But I would say it does give it a certain place of prominence in the way that it's articulated, certain metaphysical ideas. And as I say at one point in the, in the dissertation, I think historically, you know, perhaps in the West, Christianity was the first to articulate some of these things. And so it gives it a certain historical place of prominence, even if it's not a final place of prominence. Um, yeah, I'd want to be slightly cautious about even talking about Christianity in the singular at this point, uh, <laughs> and which I think tends to tends to give rise to some of those um, tends to give rise to certain reifications that can then be used in the the sort of ways you you critique when thinking about radical alterity. That it it might even be wiser to talk about sort of a variety of Christianities or a variety of authors and streams of thought. Maximus isn't universal uh and part of why you chose him and, and and centered on him so much is because he's such a powerful uh both synthesis and development of the conversation you've been tracking and because he felt he felt so different and alternative to a lot of the more western sources that i was more familiar with and mm -hmm. that felt like a yeah a different christianity mm -hmm. for me. okay uh, the, the, the last part of, of my question is, uh, first of all, great, great response. Um, just do we need 
theology at all, the theological imagination. I mean, once, once we've, once we have an account, okay, we can understand how the theology did all of the, the groundwork and, and did such important work in getting us to, to be able to speak coherently about um, ethical issues and the relation between identity and alterity and, uh, and so on. But now that we know what we should be talking about and we have the right logical categories, do we need the theological imagination at all? Anyway, that, that was sort of one direction of my question. Yeah, I mean, I won't my personal you. response would be, would be yes. I think, I think we do. I think we need spiritual categories to, to, to make sense of our world and, and where, we're, where we've come to and what drives us. I, I, I feel like we're inherently structured for transcendence and that I do, I do believe there's, there's more than there's more than we see here and that there's transcendent forces in, you know, ingressing in our world and that to make sense of where we've come, where we're at and, and what drives us for me, spiritual categories do, do seem necessary. Yeah. I'll just uh, add to that. That's one of the things I really liked about the dissertation is, uh, is that you, we're like unabashedly theological about stuff that other people would say, yeah, you know what, lighten up on the God talk, right? And maybe focus more on Jesus, right? Because everybody can agree he seemed like a nice guy. But like, ah, the God talk, uh, right? You have people like Ursula Good Enough who are into like religious naturalism. It's like we can get very religious, very like mythic and poetic and symbolic, but like lay off the God talk. And to my mind, you just, you can't. Like if we don't do it, other people are willing to do it. Like the fascists are happy to do it. And so I think, no, of course we have to. Plus you think we have like 2000 years behind us kind of pushing us forward. And what are you gonna do with that legacy? Right. And the idea that we would just abandon it seems uh, absolutely crazy. It's uh, we're gonna have to use it in the most constructive life affirming way possible. Uh, and so that's what I saw you doing there is pulling that whole tradition I mean, like, there's got to be a way where we can use this uh, for the for the good, because uh, you know it reminds me of, like the Carl Schmitt line, right? That all uh, modern political concepts are secularized theological concepts. Like, I don't know that anything's not theological. It's really hard to pull that thing out. Uh, so we have to dive into it, even right. if that means writing like 700 pages. <laughs> and if we, I feel like if we, yeah, if we pretend like it's not theological, we actually. We, we open ourselves up to, to being enchanted by, you know, modern media capitalism. We open ourselves to, yeah, the, the, the attacks from other uses of, of God and the theological that we disagree with. And yeah, it's more of a fight fire with fire and, and realize that all of us are receptive to that. I think we can't talk ourselves out of our, our tendencies to, towards wanting to believe in the divine and, and to being enchanted by these kind of things. And to, to go, I think the danger of a, of a sh shallow imminence is you know, being able to be co-opted by the forces of transcendence. We mm -hmm. need to be, to be wary of those forces. In, in your Not opinion, theology doesn't go away because you stop using the word God. <laughs> yeah. The, there is an unconscious and active theological imagination. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Sam, did you have any further? Oh, no. Yeah, I have a tiny point. I don't think um, Heidegger's Nazism was is mentioned in the dissertation. No. Um, and good. <laughs> don't. Because uh, I think the way you dealt with Levinas's response to Heidegger was perfect. And yeah, when you mentioned it in defense, I was like, oh, wait, I hope you didn't. Because what a mess. And just easier yeah. to just not talk about it. I, uh, I thought I it might be. Well, I mean, there's Levinas, but then you have like Derrida's Of Spirit, which is such a defense of Heidegger. Uh, and the end of Of Spirit, there's, you know, Heidegger's imagined kind of dialogue with theologians. It's like, hey, you'd have to get into that, but who wants to? Uh, so yeah, good. Just making sure. Because uh, I thought you handled that really well. I thought the Levinas Heidegger stuff in the dissertation was good, but it's just like t touching the third rail to bring up sure. the thoughts. I why. thought it might help 
illustrate some of what's at stake for, for folks who are, who are here today. Yeah, it's a nice way to, to kind of, in brief, why would Levinas have such a problem with Heidegger? <laughs> like that's a good <laughs> way to sum it up. Uh, so yeah, I appreciated that. Great. Does any, I'm, I'm ready to adjourn into another Zoom room with my, my colleagues. Uh, Sean, are yep, yep, good with I'm you? Right. Sam, okay. Satisfied. Yeah. Great. So now, um, those of you who've been patiently hanging out, watching us all talk to each other, will have a chance to ask Travis some questions of your own while Sean and Sam and I, uh, I think, are going to go into another Zoom room somehow, magically. Great. Matt, go ahead, you're unmuted. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, Hey Travis. Hey Matt. That was uh, that was wonderful, um, and I want to commend you for handling those really hard questions uh, so well. Um, they really made you earn it, and uh, I was impressed. Um, <laughs> and seven hundred pages. Wow. Um, it's yeah. It's just so beautiful to see you performing. Um, your your philosophy for us in this way. And I guess uh, just to keep it brief, there's like 15 things I, I could dig into with you, but you know, on this question that your committee was raising around the, the, the importance of the human uh, relative to creation or to the universe and relative to, to God or to Christ, where does the human or the anthropos fit into that? historically, like maybe now in our contemporary moment, the so-called Anthropocene, but also just ontologically um, for all time in a sense, what's the place of the human in being? Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a line in Romans that Paul writes about all of creation groaning, you know, in travail and the pangs of childbirth, waiting for human beings to wake up basically. And I wonder if, you have connected as strongly as I have to that particular statement, especially around this relationship between the human being and the universe. Um, and if so, if you do connect with it, what does that mean for you? How does that place the human being cosmologically and theologically in your vision? I'd be really curious to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. Yeah, I love, I love that passage from Romans. Um, well, I think, you know, one, one thing that I play with at the, at the beginning of the, the dissertation is some stuff from, from William Desmond from Being in the Between, if you're familiar with that book. But um, there's, this, there's this way in which, you know, mind, mind has always come after being, right? Like I say in the dissertation that mind is the child of being. and no matter no matter how much unconditional love the parent being gives to the child they can never give themselves wholly and mind can never you know fully wrap itself around being being always outflanks it and i think that there's some of these early attempts of mind and philosophy to to consume being to total you know to totalize being and to even to dominate it in this way and this is you know what a lot of the critiques of Hegel and, and others. Um, but I think when, you know, when, when mind begins to, to, to sh shift its attitude a bit and become, you know, less dominating, totalizing, it becomes, it sees itself more as, as the witness of being. It sees itself in, in praise towards being, it sees itself, you know, turn, turning back towards a, towards a cosmos that it wakes up to finds itself being, you know, the early stages of the self-consciousness of the cosmos itself. So, you know, I would very much, you know, buy into a Swimian kind of kind of approach there or or other folks. And that's one of, you know, one of the the primary roles of the human that we are, you know, groaneth in travail to the, you know, the cosmos finally finally waking up to itself. And you know, and maybe taking taking responsibility for for itself and for this trajectory. 
you know, a, a thought that comes to mind in relationship to that is um, there's the, uh, it's the epigraph of, of Edward Said's Orientalism. It's taken from, uh, from Marx's 18th Brumaire, I think. And it says, they cannot, uh, they cannot represent themselves, they must be represented. And I think in, in Marx's context, he's talking, he's talking about, uh, you know, cer certain people lower down on the social ladder, they don't know what's good for them. I mean, there's interesting contemporary parallels to that that we could discuss in another context. But Said's point is that this will always do an injustice to a person to say that they don't, you know, they don't know what's good for them. They can't represent themselves. They must be represented. That that will, you know, that always silences the other. And even if you, if you mean to do well by them, that's an injustice to the other. But when we apply that same phrase to things like rivers and rocks and plants, you know, they can't represent themselves. They must be represented. That actually does seem to be the state of affairs. And that actually seems to be, you know, something that's potentially healthy rather, rather than violent. And so I think that the question becomes much different when it's, you know, the relationships of human to humans versus humans and the rest of the world. But, of, you know, of course, we know of the dangers of, of us thinking that we know what's best uh, for the rest of the world. So I think it's a, it's a tenuous thing to negotiate, but I think there is, you know, it is a, a role of, of stewardship there. I'm not sure if those are the contexts you're asking. Are you asking more of a, a larger cosmic context or where's your thinking on this nowadays? Mm. Maybe got muted again. Hold on. Got gotcha. you. Unmute. You're there. Yes. Thanks, Jess. Um, yeah, I mean, I was I was sort of leaving it open. I mean, I I contemplate this particular sentence or a couple sentences in Romans a lot, um, and I think it has a lot. You know, one one implication that comes up as you were speaking was, um, you know, what how we think of knowledge, and if if the human is going to represent um, non-human beings, organisms or ecosystems or rivers or mountains or whatever, if the human's going to represent them, that would imply we have some um, knowledge of, of them. And in the representational paradigm we inherit from like Descartes, the knowledge is representational as a sense, uh, in, in the sense of having mastery over an object. Um, knowing as mastery and then there's another form of knowing that's maybe more participatory where we realize we're taking part in the beings that we're trying to know we're in relationship with them we're changed by the relationship they're changed by the relationship and what comes forth out of that is a would be a form of representation that's not just um i know what's best for you but oh i hear you i'm going to bring your concerns into the realm of human action where let's face it, you know, we're in charge of this planet now. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it's, it's all a matter of what we mean by knowledge when we're doing that representing. Yeah. And here, yeah, I think it's a great example of where the, the participatory paradigm is going to be better than one of radical alterity. If you, if you say, well, I can't, I can't know anything about a rock. You're, you're more likely to just, you know, to disregard the mountain and to not take care of it. Whereas if you think that you can enter into participatory relationships with other beings and beings, you know, beyond the human, I think better, better outcomes might emerge from it. Thanks, Matt. Good to see you. You know, I just, I just wanted to say, and I don't think you have to speak to this. I just, I keep hearing a kind of allergy to dependency. Um, like being a dependent being and requiring others to make choices for oneself, like in all the discussion, even people who are proposing to protect the vulnerable, there just seems to be this underlying um, allergy to, to people who are dependent because there are beings and people who, for whom we must take responsibility um, who are incapable of being these self-standing, self-sufficient kind of beings. I just wanted to throw that out there because sure. um, it just kept it just kept rising to my awareness. Yeah, I think I, I think part of it is where where the tradition is at now, and uh, a big part of some of the folks 
I'm responding to, there was, you know, there was a, there was a big backlash against, you know, drawing, drawing people into your total system of the universe or knowing, you know, knowing what's right for someone. And I think it's kind of, it's kind of a reaction to the, to the moment that we're in and that there's a, you know, there's a lot of folks that said, you know, no, that isn't, that isn't right. And, and I do think we need to strike a balance there. And I think part of, you know, part of the vision I was trying to put forth is, is a kind of balance between dependence and autonomy and acknowledging both facets of that and yeah, leaving, leaving room for one side or the other to need more attention depending on the relationship in question, because, you know, all relationships are different and relationships between humans are different than relationships between humans and mountains. Something you know a lot about. Yeah. <laughs> Truth. Um, so I, I, yeah. I hear you. I, and I don't think there should be uh, an, an allergy to that. Uh, I think it's maybe it's, it's a bit situational. Um, and sort maybe, of, maybe, but I just always wonder about reinscribing dominant values and our critiques, you know, like it mm -hmm. happens so often and it's really unconscious. Um, and I, I like your response to that. It does depend on the relationship and the nature of the relationship, um, which can change over time. And it's great to have an approach that allows for that change. Um, but I'm wondering if you address at all um, the contingency on even knowing oneself, because my own experience of myself is I don't, there's like an other inside of me that is really hard to know. And a lot of the discussion here was how do we know the other in this sure. external world? And I'm curious if you get at all, like, I, I, I'm, I surprise myself where things are revealed to me about myself, about what I am let alone what I'm doing <laughs> in the world. So um, do you address the other within? Um, it's like, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of minor within the dissertation itself, but I mean, as far back as, as Gregory of Nyssa, he says, you know, I, I, can, I cannot even know my own soul. How much less, you know, do I know the divine? Like, I can't even, you know, he says, I can't even know, you know, simple objects. I cannot know them fully, you know? But so I think there, you know, there's definitely an inner other and the same, you know, the same structure of a, a crossing of sameness and difference and a, a crossing of, yes, there's aspects we can know and there's aspects we can't know. It applies, you know, just, just as much to oneself as, you know, as to another. Cool. Okay. Next we got Jamie Sochi. Hi, um, hey, I take Jamie. my video to work, but I'm just beaming and smiling and just wanted to say a quick congratulations. That was so beautiful. Wow. Um, yeah, I just feel so sentimental to be in this space and see the fruition of all of the work that you've been doing and, you know, your, your commitment to, to ethics, um, really came through for me and just as I was listening I was even just reminded of of the wedding vows that you and Jessica exchanged and just to see how much you live the philosophy that you wrote about and talked about and how it comes up mm -hmm. in so much of your life is just gorgeous and wonderful and inspiring and love you Travis congratulations I'm so happy um, that I got to witness this moment for you. Well, I'm so happy you're here. I really, really appreciate it. I appreciate yeah. you saying so. Thank you. I can't wait to see, come visit you guys. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye. Thank Thanks, you, Jamie. Jamie. Bye. Thank you, Naris. So, Travis, the committee is back, and I will go ahead and unmute them now. So Travis, uh, your committee and I uh, were discussing amongst ourselves in the breakout room, and we are of the unanimous opinion that this is an extraordinary, even exemplary uh, doctoral dissertation, that your defense was exquisite, the product you've created, the dissertation you've produced is uh, really just remarkable, a pleasure to read, stimulating intellectually, spiritually, ethically, uh, 
a, really a model in lots of ways. And we're unanimous in passing you without revisions. So congratulations, Travis. Let me be the first to say welcome to the PhD, uh, Dr. Travis DeRuza. Thank you, Jake. Uh, we're gonna, Je Jessica, we're gonna take a moment so if everyone wants to clap, they can. We're gonna unmute everybody for a second. All right. <laughs> all oh, wow. Well. <laughs> 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 Congratulations! I love you so much. I'm so happy for you. Thank you, everyone, so much. Thank you, members of my committee. Um, Jake, is there is there anything else from you guys at this point? It's it's a it's really uh, it's been a pleasure to work on this. Uh, I, I know I speak for all of the committee in saying it was a pleasure to read this, to engage with this, and to and also. Uh, you engaged with all of our thought in a way that was uh, it, yeah, deeply rewarding for us. So it feels like an honor to have this kind of level of uh, this this level of conversation and and collective inquiry. So thank you, Travis. Thank you. I'm so glad to hear it. It was a pleasure to work with each of you, and I really appreciate your support. And I'm happy to join the club. Yeah, <laughs> welcome. <laughs>
musical performance, creativity, etc. Well, we know there are there are people who have who are jazz musicians who have written about like what the hell is going on with the improvise. It's not random. Maybe it's it's you know the cosmos coming through me. Those are kind of perhaps tired tropes, but you're there. The other, the other thing which I was amazed at, and I'm confessing, happy about, I remember saying at an early stage of your work, it's wonderful, you're multi-talented. Please consider the upside of not privileging the centrality of astrology in your dissertation. You did tell me that, and at the, at the end of the day, you were right, evidently, or at least you had, a, you had foresight. Well, it would, have been right end up. <laughs> it would have been a different dissertation, but now, you know, I don't know, maybe you can be the Dane Rudyard of our day and, and re-energize the awesome ethical cosmological force of, you know, what you and also Jessica's doing. My God, you guys are like multi-talented. Anyway, I've talked too much. Thank you. Congratulations. It's a great honor to have met you in this life. And I look forward to your future adventures and would love to stay in touch. And thanks for all your work, Jessica, in this regard, too. Thank you. Sweet, Stephen. Thank you so much for being here. Your words mean so much to me and to Travis. Thank you, Stephen. I really, really appreciate it. Appreciate you tuning in. We're going to inject some Derrida into astrology. And the lotus feet are going to go to the moon. <laughs> <laughs>